Good evening and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church on this Sunday night. Stand with me and sing number 395. In my heart there rings a melody. 395. everywhere we go. I pray that you would open up our hearts to the message you have for us tonight. I uh, pray that you give the preacher the words to speak. I pray that everything we do glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue our singing with number 355. Wonderful Grace of Jesus. I 
think you need to stand up to help me out with those higher notes. I just, you know, you're just kind of laying back. You got to stand on this last verse. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most divine by His transforming power, making Him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, that got your singing in, didn't it? <laughs> It's a great song. How, those of you who are used to singing the, that song in parts, that was tough, wasn't it? You had to wing the words. It's good to have you here with us and good to see you tonight. I hope God's blessed you. We had the backpack thing. And if you wanted to pray for a kid, but you didn't get in on that, Miss Jan, I'm sure we'll let you find a kid somewhere that, in the world that we can let you pray for. I, and you say, well, now, am I going to be able to see the kid's picture and everything? I'll send you a picture of one of my grandkids for $10 a month. Okay. And you can look at it and pray for anybody you want. I wouldn't mind you praying for my grandkids and they go to school. I, I, every one of them this year, matter of fact, all the ones in Oklahoma all went to new schools. They all, that's strange, but all four of them moved up to a new school system this year. So they're kind of excited. And uh, it's going to be cool next year, this time next year, uh, all of my son's kids who have never been to a public school will be going to public school in Guam. Not just change. You're talking about Guam is a different county in Texas than Tarrant, right? <laughs> I thought so, but uh, they'll be going to public school there, so it's going to be quite a change. And they'll be glad for, that you pray for them as well. Right now, though, we're going to yeah, ask you something really important. Okay, how many of you guys consider yourself really smart? You're just really, really smart. I, I know you do a lot. A lot of you think you're a lot smarter than we do. But anyhow, here's the question. What do you call a sheep that's covered in chocolate? A candy ball. <laughs> what do you call a cow that just had a calf? Decaffeinated, that's right. What day of the week do chickens hide? Friday, that's true, amen. Why, is, why are horses so mild-mannered and happy all the time? Their lives are real stable. <laughs> Kylie, this one's for you. What's the difference uh, between a guitar and a fish? You can tune your guitar, but you can't train a tuna. There you go. There you go. I don't write these guys. I just read them off the deal, okay? So there you go. So I'm, we got it, but it's good to have you with us. Every once in a while, uh, and I don't care how bad the world gets, uh, you know it's all right to laugh. Do you know that? And one of the best things, I've been to funerals and things, and sometimes I actually was at a funeral and uh, was with the family, and it, it, the dad had gone on to be with the Lord, and we were sitting talking with some people, and they were talking about all the things that the dad did, and we got to laughing at a funeral right before the funeral started. And uh, the funeral director came in and said, came over and asked us to leave. Would you guys leave? You're bothering the family with a, your frivolity. I said, really? I said, well, I'm, I'm the pastor, and this is his son and two daughters right here. You, know, you all all right with it? And we were the ones laughing and cutting up because we were talking about how what all the things and the goofy stuff he did and you know and how much he was fun to be around and how you know sometimes guys you just gotta think about it and, 
and, and laugh. You can't tell me you can't look at those and remember sometimes that losing somebody is hard enough. If you're not allowed to remember the good stuff, it's even worse. And so you pray for those people who are going through that. You pray for them, but you remember, um, laugh sometimes. Figure something out. You say, well, preacher, you know those corny jokes of yours. You laughed, didn't you? So that's all that matters. <laughs> remember to pray for the folks on our prayer list. Remember that. And we ask God to bless our country. And especially with all the kids going back to school, uh, we're, we're asking God to make it a lot easier than it has been. And just getting, getting back in so the kids know what to do in regular classes and what they what to have that was extremely traumatic for everybody last year for parents as well a lot of people became parents some of us became television evangelists and some of the parents became teachers and and so it was a it was a difficult time and hopefully the lord's allowed us to be able to calm down a little bit pray for that in our country and pray for peace will you the Bible says you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and a lot of times you you do that when you're praying, and you're praying out loud in church, and we ask you and thank you for that. But you know, you might want to start praying for peace in America and asking God to give us some unity back and forth, all right? And so for, with that said, we're going to ask Brother Bill if he would could and come and you'll lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do, Lord, ask you for not only the peace of Israel, Lord, but we pray for the peace for here at home. Amen. Lord, uh, certainly many challenges that we face, uh, but help us, Lord, as we go through our daily walk, Lord, to remember that you walk beside us, Lord, and that yes. you're, you're the same God yesterday and today and forever. Lord, help us to uh, seek your wisdom through your word. Help us, Lord, to to look to you for our strength and encouragement. Lord, I pray this for our students, Lord, and, and just pray that they would have a much better year than last year was, Lord, that would uh, help them as they return to school, Lord, that they would uh, be able to concentrate on, on their schooling, Lord, in a more normal uh, way that they're used to, Lord, but at the same time, Lord, Always remember their their testimony and always remember, Lord, to, to put you first in all that they do. Lord, I pray for the parents as they help their children to continue in, a, in another school year. Give them the ability to, to help this, these, their children and, and to help them through the struggles, Lord. And I pray also for the teachers, Lord, and the staff that work at schools. Not only the ones that we know, Lord, but the ones that... Uh, Maybe we don't through extended families. Just give them the ability, Lord, to uh, to, to things to to go well, and to look to you for their strength. Lord, I thank you for all that you do. Your watch care over us, Lord, and then I just pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, as a a church to be in prayer for our nation, prayer for our students and, and teachers and staff workers, Lord, and for each one uh, that here is. Uh, that is part of our church body, Lord. Help us to serve you better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> disciples when Jesus was going away. The 
But as he rose through the clouds, he left them this message. He said, I'll come back for you the same way. Tarry here a little while, my brother. Tarry here and work while it's day. Tarry here, it won't be much longer. Till I come back to take you away. Now this road that I travel sometimes gets so rocky. It feels like I just can't go on. But the thought cheers my heart when I stop to remember. Very soon now we're all going home. Terry come back to take you away. Tarry here a little while, my brother. Tarry here and work while it's day. Tarry here, it won't be much longer till I come back to take you away. Tarry here a little while, my brother. the book of Habakkuk again. Last Sunday night you were in Habakkuk, so you found it. Now it's easy to get back to tonight. The book of Habakkuk. Now I will tell you this, if you're a pastor, and most of you aren't, but those of you who preach or teach or speak or anything else, you ought to be about the same place. I promise you that there's times when I've pastored for years, and you get up and somebody takes the book right out of your Bible. And you're up in the front of everybody and you're trying to find it, you know, when you learn. it was here yesterday. I know it was out there because I was studying out of it. But we, in the book of Habakkuk, we talked to you last week about that a little bit. I want you to look back with me and we're going to go, by the way, Habakkuk between Zephaniah and Nahum. OK, we're going to look at chapter number two again. And I want you to look down to verse 14, just one verse. I want you to think about this. I pretty much put the whole verse up as a title of my message, okay? In chapter 2, look down with me in verse 14, it says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but that's kind of a neat thing, the analogy there. As the waters cover the sea, if there's no water, it's not a sea. It may be six inches deep, but those water is what makes it to sea, right? All right, I was just thinking about that. You say, what's that mean? I don't know that, but it's an interesting analogy. But I do know he meant this, that as absolute as it would be water for a sea, there's going to come a day when the earth shall be filled with a knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That seems so abstract to us. How's that going to be possible? We, what, what have we been preaching Jesus for 2,000 years now? 2021 for some of it, more than that. All the Old Testament saints and all the things that went on with the, the Jewish people and all the propagation of God and God's stuff for all these thousands and thousands of years. And, and if you wouldn't be careful and if you didn't look for it or know what to look for, you'd swear it hadn't made any effect at all. It has made religious effect, but as far as the humanity itself, it's hard sometimes to see that, that Jesus has made a big effect in the world. And part of that's because when we're in the world, we have a tendency, not because we really want to, but we have to function in the world to be able to survive here. I don't know about you guys, I still have to go to the store and I have to get my car fixed and I have to get the driveway paved and y'all have to do all that stuff too? Man, I thought when I got saved, I wouldn't ever have to mow the yard again. But anyhow, well, you understand, we're, do, we're spending a lot of time just doing the things that we have to do. Don't get discouraged over that. Can I tell you that? And, and I was telling the preacher friends of mine, and, and I'm not like anybody's leader, okay? I just 
I ask God things. God allows me to see things or talks to me. Maybe because he feels like I'm the most needy. I don't know. But I will tell you this. You know, I've, I've, sometimes when it feels like we're just spinning our wheels or we're just staying, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you privately about that as a church sometime. But as a whole, uh, the Lord brought to my mind two or three different instances, and I've shared them with pastors trying to be a help for them because we're working through this. A lot of us are running uh, far fewer people in our churches today than we did. Matter of fact, according to George Barna, 90% of our churches are functioning on less than 80% of our people from two years ago. Okay, I just read what I put out there. I don't know George personally, okay? But I will tell you that that's, that seems close to cost of board. Uh, what's happened? Well, there are a lot of things. But I will tell you, in which things like we're doing, it's kind of the same thing we're working on. We're getting up. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, getting ready for Sunday, getting messages ready, getting stuff ready, visiting people. You know, and, but you know, most of the time in your life, guys, it's always been just like that. One of the most discouraging times of life has to be for a mama who has a toddler. And a lot of times, some of the greatest comforting words you've told that mom as an older lady is, they will grow up. Or the mom that has a teenager and you've told them, they will leave home someday. You know? <laughs> and fortunately on that, and you're not right in most of them, they're still there living in the basement or in the attic, one of the two. But with this, do you, do you ever think about, if you took all the time, Let's take the guy named Joseph. You know how the story and you know the, how thing and what he did and how he changed the world around. And God used him to do those mighty things. You know, if you added up everything that Joseph did and all the stories that he did for his whole lifetime, and the scripture says he lived to be quite old, you got about 30 years there of the things he did. He was 17 when he went in. He was 30 when he was made overseer of all of Egypt. The scripture tells us that. So those years, do you understand about three or four of those years, he was somebody's servant working in his garden until the guy said, you know, you're pretty smart. Once you become head of my household here and work your way up to the, that he worked his way up into that. He's just doing regular stuff. He, he gets in Potiphar's house and his wife accuses him. And then he goes to the prison and he makes this big thing, you know, saying, you know, these, the two people from Pharaoh after a few years, he said, you don't know what he did the first few years. And they come in and the butler and the baker and he, he interprets their dream. Then he waits two more years before anything else happens. So you got half of that time, at least seven to 10 years in there. You know what he was doing? Just mundane stuff. He's running somebody's place. He's working on somebody's house. He's running the jail. He's organizing stuff. And none of that got written down in history and probably nobody in all of eternity would care. But that's what he was doing. After the Genesis ends, and you find out that Joseph dies in the end, there's about 35 or 40, 50 years between the time when you hear about them all coming back and the brothers and stuff and then... Jesus, Joseph dying. You know what he did? He ran Pharaoh's country for him. He administrated things. He filled up things. He filled out paperwork. He operated their computer systems, all that kind of stuff like that, you know. <laughs> Made sure their camels had their, although, uh, you know, their service plans up to date and things. And what a, that, guys, that's what he did. And those whole, every, all those years, he served the Lord. And we, I don't, don't get discouraged because something brand new in your life doesn't happen every day. There is going to be something brand new happen someday. Then that thing is, this is, this, that, that is, for the earth shall be filled with a knowledge, not of the Lord. I'm not, it will be. But I, I can tell you this, guys, okay, when, when the knowledge of the Lord comes in, that's going to be easy. When God has all those lost people stand in judgment before him, they're going to know God's there. That's not quite what he said. He said, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And right now, as far as I can tell, the only people who know that are people who know the Lord. 
Because the lost people don't recognize him. I think he's working in a lot of their lives and they don't even recognize that. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Do you, you see that verse? There's earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Well, one of the great things about who you are and where you get to go to church is your preacher believes there's a kingdom coming and it has not happened yet. You say, well, pre preacher, I'm, you know, all my life I've been taught that we're living in the kingdom of heaven right now. Well, yeah, we are. But this is not the kingdom of God. They're two separate things. In the kingdom of God, it's absolute. He rules with a rod of iron. In the kingdom of heaven, it's got good fish and bad fish and good people and bad people and wheat and tares and all that kind of stuff in it. That's the world we're living in. Okay? And you've got to keep those two separated. Don't, don't, don't get it out or you, you, you'll be in big trouble. We have a kingdom to come that the Lord's going to come and personally rule on the earth in the flesh. David's going to come back with him and rule and reign from Jerusalem. It's going to be a Jewish kingdom. We get to be part of it because we're saved, debated, and we're adopted. Hey, I had a, years ago, I had a couple of Greyhound buses. We used them at our children's home. And they, we got them from a place in South Florida called Hausman's Bus Sales. If you're named Hausman, guess what you came from. You're a, you're a Jewish person, okay? He's a Jewish guy. And uh, I was sitting in his office one day trying to trade in one bus for a new bus. And I asked him if, uh, if he knew Jesus. And he said, do you know anything about the God of the Jews? I said, yep, I do. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you don't know this, but I'm an adopted Jew. He said, you're adopted by a Jewish family named Nukem? <laughs> I said, well, that's not it. You don't get this. Jesus was a Jew. He looked at me funny. And I said, because he's the savior of the world and paid for my sins, the Bible have, said I've received the spirit of adoption into the family of God. And Jews, Jesus was, is God, and so I'm an adopted Jew. He went, what? <laughs> Let's talk about buses. So anyhow, uh, I'll tell you, there, there's nothing greater than knowing what, where we're going when it's over with. And I want you to think about that. The glory of the Lord. If you go to Israel today, and I haven't been in several years, but I can tell you, if you, t if you stood up in a public place in Israel or any place else and said, Jesus never existed, half the Jews there would shoot you. They make a ton of money because Jesus existed. Okay? Most of their, about a third of their income was from tourists coming in and out and spending money and stuff there. Nobody goes that rumor started that he's really not real there. They just don't believe he's the son of God. See, that's the difference. We not only know there is and see him, we know the glory of the Lord. There's a big difference. Did you get that? I mean, the scripture says, the whole earth, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. There's going to come a day when God will make that known to him. It won't be on this side of the tribulation. It'll be on the other side of it. When God reveals himself to the world, he's, they're going to see the glory of God. We'll talk to you about that. For the whole earth, to the Jews, they're going to get a chance to see him. And whether you like it or not, I have never understood anybody that, that doesn't get this. If I was an adopted child in a family, the last thing I'd want to do is cause trouble between the real kids and me. What about you? I, I want to fit in as much as I could and work it in there. I'm adopted in this family. I have no problem about knowing this, that my God loves his people. They're the covenant people. We're in the new covenant people, which happens to include them as well as us. But they're the covenant people. They're the ones that he's promised, no matter what happens between now and then, you're going to get to rule and reign with the kingdom if you, okay? He gave them away. He picked them out. He chose them above everybody else on the face of the earth. I get to come in as an adopted kid. I'm, ha I'm grateful. I get all the same privileges and all the same things. And we're going to have a great time with it. But to the Jews, he said, one day, all those people who rejected him, look at this, Jeremiah. The day is come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth with brought up children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But 
The Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from the country which was driven, and they shall dwell in their own land. That's the kingdom time. If you go further with me, you say, well, preacher, um, did they, they know that? Well, sure they knew that. Did they believe it? And that's a different story. Because the scripture says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That was written to Jewish people in Isaiah chapter number 9. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government. Listen to me. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with justice, with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. That's not 40 verses from the verse we quote. That's the verse right after the one we quote about Jesus being the counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace. He's also going to be the ruler of the world. And they're going to see his glory. Good or bad, they're going to see his glory. Habakkuk believed it. Jesus said it. And Paul preached it. Jesus said, thy kingdom come. You say, well, we're already in it. Then why do you ask him to make it come? I, now, I know we call this the kingdom of heaven, but let me tell you the best I can how this works. Can I? David went to the Lord and he said, I want to build your house. And God said, mm, no. A couple of things in your lifetime that I'm kind of a little leery about. And one of them is that you're too bloody a man. When God made David, he made him a warrior. Now, he had mighty men, 33 of them, they could do things that were unreal. And you read about what they did, and when you can jump into a pit and kill a lion with your bare hands, and I'm not messing with you on Friday night, you understand that? And when you can go down into a pit and kill a giant with a stick, your stick and he has a spear, okay, when you take out 800 in one day all by yourself, or you stand like Shuma, who could defend against a whole garrison and still win. Those guys, and David was their leader. When you read that, it said he was the good, but he, wasn't, he didn't reach the first three. The first three never reached David either. Do you understand that? David was a fighter. One time a king, Saul, said, I'll tell you what I'll do, because he wanted him dead. He said, if you go bring me back the four skins of a hundred Philistines, you can have her to wife. Now that, that's a pretty tough job, okay? Um, there's a comment to be made here, but not in mixed company, all right? You know what David did? Go back and read the scripture. He asked him for, he went and got 200. Might as well have fun doing it, right? Now, in my mind, you know what I can see David doing? Him and that mighty men group of his? Getting up somewhere, valuing Ziglag on some Thursday morning, Friday morning. Saying, hey guys, you know what? There's a Philistine town up here. They're giving Israel a lot of trouble. I say we go up there and kill them all. And on the way back by, we'll stop by that pizza place over on the side of the road we all like and eat lunch. And, we're, and I'm not kidding. That's the way he thought. He was a warrior from the word go. He's the one that wrote in the Psalms, for the Lord hath taught my hands to war. He was some kind of mine. So when he said, can I build you a house? God said, mm -mm, you're too bloody a man. You can't do it. But you're going to have a son. And he's going to be a man of peace. He's going to build me a house. You know what David did? From that minute on, David started laying up treasure for the house that Solomon would build. From that day on, when you go back, someday when you've got a lot of time and you want to question me with it, I'll take you to the scripture and I'll show you it wasn't Solomon who drew the plans for the temple. 
It was David. And the scripture says so. He's got it all planned out. He bought the property. He's laying up treasure for it. All that things, that stuff, that gold, that material, that payments and those things that they built the temple with, David had it stockpiled. Solomon didn't have to raise all that. Now you see, <clears throat> okay, we're, we're not in the kingdom of God yet. When I get there, I'm going to be in my brand new body. And I won't be the sinner that I am and I'll be changed to be able not only to be around the Lord, but to serve Him fitly. All right, so what are we doing? We're in the kingdom of heaven. We're laying up treasure for it right now. It's not much of a kingdom when the king's not here. Somebody else is in charge of all the kingdom things. They own the grounds and they own the vineyards and somebody else is running it. Remember all them parables? When he comes back, he's going to be running it all. Every bit of it. The whole world. And they will see his glory. Thy kingdom come. Thy will, will be done on earth. Now think with me, when you say that verse, how much tolerance is in that when he said, and he, the measure is, as it is in heaven. I'm thinking there's no tolerance in that. In heaven, his will is done absolutely. On the earth, we're kind of tolerated with it. Big difference in that kingdom when it comes. I charge thee, Paul said this, before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. See, that's different than where we are now. I like being where I'm at now. I love serving the king I have now. I'm like John Adams and several other the people that when they founded a country, they tried to get George Washington to be the king. John Adams said, America only has one king, and that's Jesus. We well, have others in the world right now thinking that they're kings, but they're not. We only have one king, and that's Jesus. And he's going to be the absolute king when he comes, and there won't be any doubt about it. The scripture says this, and here's the verse. Jesus heard it. He marveled. Now, here's what he heard. This centurion who loved Jewish people, I think it's the same centurion as Acts chapter 10. The same one that gets saved. This is my answer. How do you know that? I don't. I just said I think it. He loved Jewish people. You go back and compare it. That guy gave alms and or he's got a Jewish servant that's sick. He's a Roman centurion. He walks about 40 miles or rides his horse or however he does to get to Jesus to say, will you heal my servant? That Jewish guy that works for me. All right. You must really care about him, right? And Jesus says something to him. Okay, I'll go to your house. And he said, no, no, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. And he says this marvelous thing. He says, I am a man under authority. Anybody here that's ever been in the military understands this. Listen to me. I don't care what rank you are. You have the authority of that rank because you follow the orders of the one who is ranked above you. When you quit doing that, you lose your authority. Isn't that the way it works, guys? And he said, I'm under authority because I do what my superiors tell me. I can say to this soldier, you go and you come back and you go and you do this and you do that. And he said, and he looked at Jesus and Jesus understood what he said. He said, you know why I know you don't have to go to my house? You're under the authority of God. And as long as you do what he wants, anything you want to do, he'll let you do it. You just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I've not found so great a faith in all of Israel. He understood the relationship between Jesus 
doing the will of his father. And therefore, the Lord gives him the ability to do what he was doing in the world. The scripture says, when you heard it, he marveled and said to them, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, now watch this, guys. This is a Gentile guy. Many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And boy, I want you to understand. You know what Jesus does with us here, guys? We have the same place when we come through Christ. We have the same covenant when we come through Christ. We have the same father when we come through Christ. We have the same fellowship of brothers and sisters when we come through Christ. And one of these days when our heavenly father sends the son into the world to show the world who he really is, the world will see the glory of it. And we'll be able to see it. Paul said, now I see through a glass darkly. But then I'll see face to face. It's going to be good stuff, isn't it? Can you imagine that? I talked about you this morning. They tell you that I talked about you. That song you sing, Will I Dance for You, Jesus? I don't, I don't. You ever wonder what it's going to be like to be, to be able to actually see Jesus like he is and, and, and be righteous enough in our new bodies and our resurrected person to be able to understand it and to, to develop it? And I don't, I don't think my brain can handle that right now. And God knew that. Corey Ten Boom, when she was about eight years old, was going with her dad in a trip. To a, she wrote in her, her biography, autobiography, she said, I asked my dad, can I, can I hold my ticket? And he said, no, better not. He said, when you get old enough, and we're pretty sure that you can handle it, then we'll let you carry your own ticket. You know, I don't, I don't think the Lord has any doubt of who we are and just exactly what we're, we can handle. And there's a lot of things he hadn't told us. We see through a glass darkly still, but we know it's going to happen. How's he going to do that? I'm like Al Jones told me one time, he was my pastor. Some guy came and said, oh, if you're so smart, where's heaven at? He said, no, I'm not in charge of logistics. I'm not in charge of how you get there or where it's at. That's not my job. The prophets revealed the Gentiles would get an invitation to be a part of this kingdom. Look at this. This is no new thing. In that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which will stand for an ensign of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek. You know what an ensign is, right? It's your company flag. It's that thing that you hold up as your standard. This is it. Here I'll plant my Ebenezer. That's, your, that's it right there. Sometimes that thing may be a rock or sometimes it's a flag or sometimes it's something, but it's where you have. You ever played paintball? You capture the flag? You ever done that? Well, I want you to understand that. That's what he's telling you, that we're going to be able to see it, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of people because he did it once and now he's going to do it again. He's going to bring them back from all over the world this time, not just the Ju Judea and Benjamin. He's going to bring everybody back when they don't even know who they are yet. He's going to bring them back. He listed all the places he's going to bring up, and he said, it, it shall be set as an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel together with the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Did you notice that we get to be a part of that? Isn't that good stuff? That's good stuff. Isaiah said, it's a lot thing that thou shouldest be my servant and raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the reserved of Israel. But I will also give thee for a lot to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. Isaiah 49, 6. I believe it. See, one of the great things of all the earth is this. Jesus had just talked to them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Every Jew understood exactly what that was. They had to eat their sacrifice and take it in. And they understood exactly what he's talking about. Besides that, so do you. You ever been around somebody and somebody's telling some story and you're watching around and you go, when you walk out of the room going, well, those people just ate that up. You ever done that? Yeah. He had them eating right out of his hand. Okay. I thought you might understand that once you put it down there. And we've said it ourselves. 
Well, a lot of the people didn't like that. And the Bible says many of them went away. And Jesus turned to the 12 and said, will you also go away? Peter says something. And he says it again in the other Gospels without that introduction. And he's at Caesarea Philippi. And it's at one time it had, I don't know, nine or ten different pagan temples built there into that mountain. And they just one worship place to God. And they'd go up there and they'd worship one God, another God, another God, another God. And Jesus has his disciples sitting up there. And he asked them, well, who do you say I am? Peter gave the answer in the beginning. He said, thou art to Christ. See, but he didn't say that until he asked them, who do people say that I am? He said, oh, some think you're Jeremiah, some think you're Daniel, some think you're this, some think you're that prophet, some think you're Moses, some think you're John the Baptist. Some, okay, you get different portions of that. But he asked them this real big question. Who do you say I am? See, it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. It's what I think. Do you understand? I know God's going to reach some people and God's going to do this with other things and He's going to do with the Jewish. But you know what? He reached me. I'm in there. I'm part of it because of what I believe. Jesus is who He said He was. Who is the blessed, only potentate? What Paul said, in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want you to get that, guys. When he shows that to the world, nobody in the whole world is going to doubt it. They'll see his glory. He won't come this next time like the lowly Galilean. He'll come like the roaring lion. Revelation, it said, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. I like that. Amen. And the glory of the Lord shall be manifest to the whole world. Habakkuk knew Babylonians would face their judgment. Do you know that? You do too. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall I also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit of the spirit reap everlasting life. I'm not hyper about people being lost. I didn't want to get what I deserve. By the grace of God, I got what I didn't deserve. I talked with a good friend of mine this last week. And he talked to me about a an embedded special forces soldier that's in his church. And he said he came to church. He was a good guy and did well. And about a year ago, he won him to Jesus. He said the guy's become more and more withdrawn and back and he finally went to visit him. And he said, what's wrong? And he said, he just kept saying over and over, I'm such a wretched sinner. Such a wretched sinner. And he said, I got to tell you this. And he started telling him about his military days and incidences and things like that. And he talked to him, and he's asked him to call me. Because he asked me, so what can I tell him? I want you to get this, guys. If you really want to get to them wretched, wicked sinners, and you want to make them feel really bad, why don't you win them to Jesus? Because nobody exposes who you are to you better than Jesus does when he saves you. Because the longer you're saved, the more lost you realize you used to be. You were way loster than you thought you were. And the great part of it is you've got to believe by faith that he would save you no matter. See, he didn't learn about that yesterday. Y'all know that? Did y'all have to sit down and tell God about your background? Well, God, I don't know if you know this, but you know, when I got saved that night, I hadn't told you about. You know, he never did say that. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, it didn't say you had a name off every sin you ever done your whole life. Does God save us? Yeah. All of us good people and all of you wicked sinners. Amen. 
If there's none good, the scripture tells us that. And you can say what you want to that, but I, I'm, t I'm in it. I'm telling you, you want a person to see who they are and what they are, lead them to Jesus. And I mean it. By the way, some of those people make the best servants of the Lord you've ever seen in your whole life. Jesus said to Simon when he's in his house, Mary came in and poured that ointment on him. Go back and read the story. He said, why is this woman doing that? He said, too much is forgiven. Doing much is not hard at all. What was what? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I get the chance to talk to the guy. I want to tell him about David leaping over the wall. I want to tell him all the stories about this fighter. Do you think David's in heaven? I do. So I want you to understand something. We have an opportunity to not be weary in well-doing. Did you see that? We have a reason to believe that our best days are ahead of us. We have a reason to believe that stuff is so good, so wonderful, I can't even explain it. I don't even know all the details of it. I'm not sure how you open a door made out of pearl. Looks to me like it's a round ball, you know what I mean? So maybe it's a revolving pearl, I don't know. Y'all ever thought of that? Whatever. Seriously, have you ever thought about it? You know, it doesn't say you sliced it in little slices. It's a door of pearl. I don't know. They roll it out and get it back. I don't have a clue. You say, well, I see, I don't know that. I don't understand all, it, just what I know. And God tells us of the truths of this kingdom that's coming. I just know I'm going to be a part of it. Because he promised me I would. And everything that doesn't work out here, it'll be over and with and done when that thing's done. You understand that? And you can worry about all you want to. You give your life to Jesus and you'll find out the longer you're saved, you're a lot less perfect than you thought you were. Because after he whittles off the big chunks, you'll start working on the other smaller stuff and, and he'll, you'll never wake up any day he isn't going to say to you, I got something today. This is what we're going to work on today. Did you ever start on a project sanding off a, a bare board? You know, you ever do that? I kind of like that. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm picky what kind of boards I work on. All right. But you start off with this real heavy grit sandpaper. You know, it's, it looks like chunks of rocks glued to paper. And you rub it. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. And then you say, well, okay, you got, the, got that mountain knocked off. And then you get it. And pretty soon when you're getting down to the finish, by the time you're down, you're starting out with like 60 grit. And by the time you're done, you're up to 300 grit, which is real fine. You can polish off. I, I promise you, God will never run out of sandpaper in your lifetime. Okay? As long as you're living, He's going to work on you. Go back to my last verses, Philippians. Actually, i got two of them, one in Joshua, one in Lot. Chapter number 1, verse number 6. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. And He's not going to quit till the day of Jesus Christ, until the day of Jesus Christ. So that's cool. God's going to sand on me till I'm dead, right? Absolutely. He wants you to be the most polished, the most perfected, the most special specimen of His people the world's ever seen. Don't get weary in well-doing. Don't get discouraged. He promised Israel that a long time ago. And boy, if they're going through some things, every time they turn their face away from him, he disciplines them just like a father does a son. And every once in a while, you'll see him do that in your life. He'll let things come in you don't understand. But if you seek after him and you stay close to him, someday he'll explain it to you. Sometimes we see it in our life. When I was a kid, I thought my parents picked on me. I'm, I'm sure they did. 
What I found out when I grew older was way different. I found out even, you know, as a boss or a pastor or any place thing you do, you or if you have children, you got five kids, and you say, "Hey, will you come and do this for me?" And they go, "Sure, will," but they never show up. And you do the next one, "Hey, will you come and help me?" And they go, "No, I don't want to. I got, you know, I got something going on that day." And you get down to one, and you say, "Hey, will you do this for me?" And not them does he say, "Yes, I'll do it for you." He comes and does it, and every time you ask that one, he don't show up, and this one don't do it, and this one won't do it, but that one keeps doing it and keeps doing it. and keep, Every time, I want to ask you a question. How long is it going to be before you quit asking everybody else to go straight to the one you know is going to do it? That's exactly what you do. You're not picking on them. That's what my mom told me this day is before she died. She said, you're the one I could depend on the most. She might have been lying to me, but I took it to heart. Amen. <laughs> see, we see things. We learn stuff in the world. Think about what it's going to be like when God takes away this darkness. And he takes away this flesh and he takes away this inability to understand. And we see the glory of God. And how wonderful that's going to be. Well, the Bible says when the world sees that, it's going to terrify me. I like the side I'm on. If you read the Revelation, it said they'll hide in rocks and they'll say, you know, fall on us. I don't want to be that one. I want to be the one that says, thank God, it's here. See, that's what Habakkuk said. There's going to come a day when the whole earth is going to see the glory of God. You're privileged as a Christian to get glimpses of it day by day in the world we live in. Still tough, ain't it? Think what it's like for lost people who have no glimpse. Don't get weary in well-doing. Let's pray. Father, I pray you bless us and remind us how privileged we are. We have a Father that's promised us things that are totally out of this world. And Lord, we, just, we have one prayer. Lord, keep us faithful. Remind us of who we are and whose we are, where we're going, and what we have to do till we get there. Help us to do the mundane and help us to do the marvelous. And Lord, we pray that you'd use us in a way that when we stand before you, we couldn't believe that you could do that with us. Lord, you're that kind of God. You're that kind of Father. Lord, I pray your blessings, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. service in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious day of learning more from thy word. and We apply it to our daily lives so we can walk as Christians and give you all the glory and praise. We pray for those people that are sick, that uh, can't be here with us today. May they get to feeling better and one day return. And we, we pray for those souls that passed on and we pray for their families and uh, we pray for our kids which start school pretty quick and we pray for their teachers and administrators may they show them how to be fruitful to our communities and learn as much as they can we thank you for our preacher we thank you for all the staff at this congregation and and until we meet again Keep us safe. This we pray through Christ's name. Amen.